All right, is everybody fitting in? It's, um, if, if, if I can hear myself, so I'm assuming everybody else here can hear, yeah? Well, welcome to everybody for coming along to the launch of the Business Union. And I think the first thing I want to do is, is thank Graham, who's a, an accomplice in this. Graham is one of these people that you meet in your life and he forces you to think a new way about everything that you previously thought. And uh, I remember standing at conferences and Graham would be at one side and we'd be arguing about almost exactly the same thing in completely different ways. And almost nothing's changed. So it's ironic, Graham has a long history in employment relations, whereas I'm the complete opposite and never think employment relations matter much at all. Um, so when I became the president of a Queensland Chamber of Commerce and it was thrust upon me to always worry about industrial relations, it was actually quite a foreign thought to me. Um, I've been in business for years and I've never really had problems. Um, I've always seen that the, the interests of the business owner and those of the staff are absolutely aligned. Uh, but I've also seen that the business owner goes to sleep at night worrying about wages and worries about how to pay the bills. And I've had that. No, one thing I've learned is in business, doesn't matter, you see the successful business people. I'm looking across at Phil DeBella, who's, who's hosting us here today, and I want to thank Phil as well. Most particularly for his, his absolute courage. He always speaks out, doesn't he? And he's, he's a beautiful man. And I watch him on his, uh, on his clips on, on LinkedIn, and uh, I'm very thankful for, for a guy who goes out there and actually just says things that need to be said. And, and he does it, he wears his heart on his sleeve. But look at Phil and I look at other business people in this room that I know, and the one thing you can be certain of is every single one of them has had one of those, uh, you might have to beep this out, oh shit moments, where they're in business and frankly they don't know how they're going to make the wages next week. I don't care who you are, if you've been in business, you've had one of those experiences. And it's been really, really tough. And for every successful business person that you see out there, there's plenty who have tried just as hard and maybe just didn't catch that lucky break at that moment. And so I, I look at everybody who's made it through, and I'm thankful for them, but I'm also conscious of those that didn't. Today, I wanted to say a few, few words about a few different things. Obviously, COVID is one of these things that's dominating the headlines everywhere all the time. And I, I want to say that the worst thing about COVID that we've all discovered is that it's turned the government into the HR department of every business in the country. If you think HR departments are bad, try having the government as your HR department. That's what we've all now got. And what does that produce? It produces higher staff turnover, dissatisfied employees, lower profits, disputes everywhere, and fundamentally, as a nation, we can't afford for that to continue. So having bureaucracy and government, they've just stepped into every business in the country. And it's most particularly felt by small business who are not used to these creatures in their, in, their, in their ranks. Big business now, I think, is also starting to discover this stuff's not fun. Uh, and as a nation, we're gonna have to move on. We have to actually get back to normal. Not a new normal, actual normal. And uh, so I, I wanna, wanna start with that. The other thing I, I did wanna talk about was um, small business, is, is one of those things that, have you ever seen politicians who say, we're the party for big business? Has anybody ever heard them say that? I haven't. There's a few journalists in here. They would have been around any number of uh, launches of a thousand things through the years. You never see a politician striding out kind of, I want to be known as the politician or the party of big business. Why is that? It's because big business is not the hopes and dreams of every Australian. Small business is. Small business is something that's special. Small business is something that speaks to the Australian character of people having a go. Um, and and it's, I guess it's a sign of the respect because we know that these business people actually are putting their families on the line, they're putting their houses on the line, and they are doing something special. They're the undergirdings of what makes Australia great. And you, and you know that when a politician goes out and constantly tries to turn small business people into a prop, standing next to them, shoulder to shoulder, 
You hear, you hear politicians all the time saying, you know, we created all these jobs. Really? Are you kidding me? You might be able to create an environment that fosters jobs, but I've, I'm yet to see politicians produce jobs that aren't just more bureaucracy. Um, so, with respect, all political parties, nearly all of them, are turning business into props. And they need to back it up. They need to actually show real respect. Um, I, 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 you know, anybody, anybody ever heard that, that, that they want to stand next to big business? No. But I'll say this, big business, politicians don't necessarily want to stand next to big business, but they are the plaything of big business. Big business in this country has its lobby in Canberra, it has its lobby in George Street, it has its lobby in every state government and big council in this country. And my sense of it is, as a country, we're going backwards because we're not embracing what made us great. One of the first key moments for democracy in Australia was the Eureka Stockade. And everybody knows the Eureka Stockade and sees it as a workers' rebellion. But that's actually not the truth of it. The truth of the Eureka Stockade is it was small business people who didn't want the government mandating, licensing and controlling how they did business. It was actually small business people who'd come from foreign lands all around the country, who'd all come. And it was small business people who believed in, in wealth and work for toil. And it was small business people who said to government, we're not going to be regulated by you. We're not going to have our wealth transferred to you at the stroke of a pen. We're in the sun. We're in the elements. We're doing the back-breaking work and we want fair pay for what we do. And my sense of it is every small business in Australia is like one of those people at the stockade in Eureka. It's time for the government and bureaucrats to get out of our way and stop doling out our share of the pie. Every time you make a loss in small business, do you know who funds it? The small business owner does. They go and remortgage their house. They work for free, for years at a time. But you know, every single time that they make a profit, there's a shareholder who shows up and wants 30%. So it's called the government. But it's worse than that. On their way to making a profit, they get hit with payroll tax, they get hit with land tax. They get hit with work cover. They get hit with rules that don't make sense. Additional regulations they've never asked for. And so it makes that task so much harder every single time. But the government is a 30, 25 to 30% shareholder in every one of your businesses. And it only shows up the day you, look, you make money. The day you lose, you lose on your own. And for all the business people who know exactly what that feels like, that's what this union's about. It's about all of us coming together and chipping in together and actually creating the new Eureka Stockade where small business people are actually going to tell politicians and bureaucrats to get out of our businesses, to get out of our world, to get out of stopping us making money. COVID's taught us a few things and it's at the back end. I want this to be the backdrop of... of of what the future of the business union is. COVID's taught us a few things. It's taught us that coffee shop owners can't work from home. Truck drivers can't work from home. Miners can't work from home. Neither can builders, nurses, doctors, farmers, sailors, pharmacists, and on goes the list. None of these people can work from home. Isn't it interesting to note that government can nearly always work from home? For a couple of years now, they've been able to work from home, quietly making rules for us all, establishing themselves in the HR department of all of our businesses. Government can work from home and nobody else seems to be able to. Just leave that with you as a thought. Who do you think is the lifters? Who are the doers? Who are making the wealth for this nation? It's the people who show up. It's the people who have to go to work. And it's time, it's overdue, that we allow those people to get back to work without mandates and rules and regulations that no longer, frankly, make sense. So if COVID's taught us one thing, it's taught us that we're not all in this together. There's the doer class and 
is the parasite class. And it's time that we actually started backing the doers, because that's what makes Australia great. There is, there is also a reality in this country, we're a trading nation. We've, we've, we've grown up on the sheep's back, now it's on the miners shovel. But the reality is if we don't let businesses do what they do, the actual wealth of this nation bleeds out. We pat ourselves on the back all the time, but we have to compete against the globe. And every time we compete against the globe, with one arm behind our back, with a bureaucrat reading down our throat, we're weaker. And I just want to be so thankful to the business owners who have come here today. They were going to come for union drinks this afternoon. I'm thankful that you guys are going to stand with us and everyone's going to go out there and actually no longer be a prop of government, but actually be a voice to government and actually fight, fight like those at Eureka Stockade did to actually get back our rights and actually allow ourselves to go out there and support the families and the workers and the whole ecosystem that relies on us. So thanks for coming today. <laughs> Wanted to pass across just for a, a few few minutes to, uh, to, to a couple of the uh, politicians who have come along today. And uh, they might have noted my comments, people want to stand with small business, yeah? Um, I doubt any of them want to say, yeah, we want to stand next to the big businesses. So, um, first, Campbell, uh, I'd like you to come up and say a few words. Um, Campbell, before, actually I won't steal his thunder, I said, look, I had a handwritten speech and I thought Campbell had a type one, but he had something else for me before, I'll hand over to him. Uh, thanks so much, uh, David. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. Can I acknowledge David Goodwin? Uh, can I acknowledge Phil DeBella and his team here at the Coffee Commune? Uh, but particularly, I acknowledge Senator Hanson and the small business owners that are here today and the officials of the business union and the Red Union. Ladies and gentlemen, last week the Premier did a press conference and not that I advocate people being rude and interrupting you know, uh, politicians actually you know, uh, participating and, and, and being involved in our democratic process. But the Premier was interrupted on the Gold Coast by a gentleman who was very upset. He was very upset about the way he was treated. But the interesting thing was the response of our Premier, who gave her usual faux apology, but then proceeded to push a line that she understood how distressing things had been because it was so, so hard for everybody. And essentially the theme, I'm not sure if you use the exact, exact words, but the theme was, you know, we're all in this together. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we have not all been in this together for the last two years. And the Premier and the bureaucrats and the other politicians have not lost a day's pay, not lost a day's work, and have continued on in their careers while they... Uh, actually handed down the edicts to all of us. But lest you think I'm just having a go at the Labor Party, I am not, because I need to continue to make this point, but I am no longer with the Liberal National Party. I am with the Lib Dems, and I left because the Coalition, federally, and the LNP <coughs> of this state have similarly failed to stand up. The state opposition failed to stand up over the last two years, when draconian restrictions that should have been challenged and fought on the floor of parliament, fought in the media, yeah, 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 didn't yeah, yeah. basically yeah, yeah, bugger yeah. all. No. At the federal level, we had Scott Morrison saying we're all this together. Didn't offer a pay cut there either. We also saw Josh Frydenberg tellingly at the start of this whole disaster of a two-year period saying that business could go into hibernation. Well, he, he seemed to eventually get off that term because it's rot. Businesses do not hibernate. The comments from all these people are telling. We have a political class in our nation today who know nothing about business because they've never been in business. Now, I hasten to say right now, David, you introduced me as one of the two politicians. Yes, I've been a politician, but for the last seven years, I have been self-employed. I run a financial services business. I have two employees. And uh, three business partners, and 
We've had a successful business, but we know all about government bureaucracy, ladies and gentlemen. And sadly, the politicians who create the rules have no idea. In my own business, I have to deal with ASIC. Um, and when I deal with them, I have to log in three different, on three different portals to give them all the information they need. I have to deal with APRA. I have to deal with Austrac. And I have to deal with the ATO. And under this coalition government, there's been an unending stream of new bureaucracy and regulation. For example, for the small business owners here, how many of you have got your new director ID number? Yeah. When, when was that one an election policy? Everybody treated as though they are some sort of wannabe criminal. It's just not on, and from a coalition government who on the Liberal Party's homepage, they talk about their values as being supporting small business. Well, it's rot. So that's what we've seen over the last two years, but it was there already anyway from our governments. But turning to the importance of this event today, the need for this business union, one of the things that's disappointed me perhaps as much as the failure of the political class and the bureaucracy is the way that peak industry bodies who are meant to represent business have also failed and been missing in action. Now, I'm not going to name names today, but you'll get the gist of what I'm saying. The peak business group in this state has been missing in action. The peak tourism group in this state has been missing in action. And if there's a sector that's particularly been absolutely damaged, it's tourism. And yet they have not stood up. And why is that, ladies and gentlemen? It's because they have been captured by government. Yeah, yeah. They get funding from government, they get grants from government, they don't want to rock the boat. I say to the small business owners across Queensland today, leave those organisations. They are bureaucracies themselves, they do not deserve your hard-earned dollar, and you need to get behind an organisation that will support you and fight for you. Now, I've known Graham Haycroft and Jack McGuire for some time, and I declare today that my own wife joined the Nurses Professional Association of Queensland some years ago. Yeah. Because turning from the professional uh, associations or those peak industry bodies to the unions, they've sold people out as well. The Nurses and Midwives Union have not stood up for nurses. Nurses in the first year of the pandemic worked their guts out to keep us all safe, to treat the sick in demanding conditions, and then when vaccine mandates came in, a whole lot of people were shown the door, waved out the door. And I can tell you what Beth Mole said when Campbell Newman provided redundancies for older nurses so that young recruits could come into the system. Beth Mole said then and continues to say today that Newman sacked nurses. Not true. We built up that system, but Beth Mole has been happy for her members to suffer from a vaccine mandate which is out and right, out and out coercion. And so it, is with the, so it is with a whole range of other unions as well. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you, join the business union. They will stand up for you as they've stood up for nurses and teachers and now police officers. We need this. We need an organisation who stands up for small business, who will take the fight against ridiculous restrictions and ongoing clawing red tape and bureaucracy. And I'm happy to say today that I have joined too for my own small business. Thank you for coming. Good luck. I hope it's a real winner. I reckon Campbell is way better having now run a business for a few years than he was before. <laughs> I feel Campbell is a kindred spirit. That's good. Um, Next, I'd like to invite uh, Senator Pauline Hanson up to say a few words as well. Uh, who, 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 who originally ran a business uh, as a fish and chip owner. That, 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 that's the story I hear. Well, that's what I'm known for. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I am sorry for my tardiness in arriving late. I was given the wrong address and I was over at Milton when I had to make a dash for here. So I do apologise for being late. Um, thank you very much, Graham Haycroft, um, and organising a small business union. Well, my business experience goes back from the age when I was 17, a business with my parents in Brisbane, making the first 
and on frozen chips. We started up in Brisbane at that time. And then from there, I went to a plumbing business with my husband. I've been a small um, pro um, primary producer and cattle. And of course, you all know that I've had a fish and chip shop, which the media will not let you forget. <laughs> they will make sure you never know, forget my background. The fact is now being a member of parliament, I'm very privileged, I'm very honored to hold that position. My time last nearly six years in for a parliament. I have seen that small businesses have been left behind. They haven't been represented by the parliament on either side. We see big business, the multinationals being looked after, but not small business. Yes, small businesses, they, they rake in about 75% of the tax from the workers that goes into paying the bills in this country. What is happening now is absolutely disgraceful to small business. And you're right, most of these politicians have never run their own business. They are basically just career politicians that have gone from university into working in an office of a member of parliament and then onto the floor of parliament. This is very, very evident. And that's why they don't understand the pain and suffering of small businesses. Constantly I hear about the red tape or green tape if you're actually on the farming sector, that this is destroying a lot of people. Even the farming sector, the average age of the farming and farmer is about 54, 55 years of age. People, and I, I'll tell you honestly, if I actually was given the opportunity to go back into small business again, would I? Probably not. I would seriously think twice about it because the gains that you get from it control over who you put on as your staff, the control by the governments, the regulations, the red tape, dealing with local, state and federal politics as well, the, the guide, the goalposts are change continually all the time, it is a struggle. Small business owners are saying to me constantly, we have to work 80, 90 hours a week plus, and then what we actually have left in it after paying our staff and expenses can we actually make a living out of it? And that is a big problem. And I don't think politicians get it, they don't understand. When I went to the rally on the weekend, well, I went out there and I faced them. And it's a pity that the Prime Minister didn't do the same. And the opposition leader, instead of criticising these people who are not basically anti-vaxxers, these people are about standing up for their rights. No different to you that are here today, standing up for your rights. And people have that right to do it. But to then criticise them and say they are nothing but, you know, anti-vaxxers, put a tag to them and denigrate them, don't put the truth across, which they didn't, because I attended that rally. I saw the numbers from the second floor of Parliament House. I would have a pretty good idea. There was at least 100,000 people there, but they won't tell you that because they want to divide Australians. They feel that you're standing alone, that you're not united. And this is what you need to do, is that you need to pull together and be united. That's why it's important and it's great to see that the business union, because united you stand, they won't divide you and you know cause problems. And it's like the people there when I went to the rally. I was there for three hours. It wasn't just a five minute appearance, three hours. I was inundated with people. People came up to me from different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, young, old, grandparents, those people from nursing professions, doctors, um, all different professions, business people. So many hugged me. And in their embracing me, they just shook. They were shaking. They were crying because they feel there's no hope. They don't realise the number of other people out there. You're not standing alone. There has to be a pushback and someone has to do it. I can do it from my point on floor of parliament, which I have done. I haven't come out the last five minutes and start raising these issues. I have been doing it on the floor of parliament for years. And I have been speaking out on behalf of so many different people, you know, different organisations and people trying to make them understand. My position on the floor of parliament is that, I don't know if you know, I actually hold the 
the shared balance of power in the Senate. The Morrison government needs three votes to get his legislation passed. There's five on the crossbench, apart from the Greens Labor, which always vote together. He needs three of those five. I control two of those votes. So there's a lot of talking, a lot of negotiations, but what I do is look at the legislation and I determine, is it in the best interest of Australia and the Australian people? If it is, then I, they will get my support. If it isn't, I then try to change it, what I think is right. Most of the time they will take up my ideas, my amendments. They brought in that apprenticeship scheme. That was my policy. Right from the beginning, it took me years to actually get them to address it. And then after a negotiation, they put $60 million into it, which created 1,360 apprentices. It was taken up within three weeks. They introduced another one six months later. Guess what? They brought it in as a policy at the end of two years ago, not last October, the year before, and introduced another 100,000 apprenticeship schemes. I had to fight tooth and nail to get that, and they found out how successful it was. These are things that people don't understand of what I have been able to achieve for Queensland, and not in Queensland, but the rest of Australia. That's why it's imperative that I get re-elected and put back on the floor of Parliament. My work is not finished yet. I also have Melbourne Roberts, who's been a great advocate and a team player with me to actually make sure that we get these fair and just policies. I'm, I'm there without fear or favour. I'm there to represent all people. And it's most important, we don't support small business. We are going to lose workers. This whole vaccine mandate is a load of BS. Because what I've seen is that people are denied the right to go to work purely because they haven't got a vaccine. If you go and own a cafe, a restaurant, here in Queensland, I'm unvaccinated and I'm not going to get vaccinated. So I can't go to a pub, club, restaurant, stadium, I can't go anywhere. And yet, if you actually have a cafe, you can't allow anyone in if the door's closed. But you can go to a shopping centre, they've got an open centre where you can buy food. You can sit down and you can get fed there. Why? Why have the rules changed? Why it's so different? If you go to New South Wales, I can walk across the border, this Mattering border, and I can go into a pub. So the laws are different. When I actually um, raised on the floor of Palm yesterday, last year, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> excuse me, it's old age. It's, <laughs> it's not nervousness, it's old age. So anyway, what, what I brought in was a private member's bill to do it away with um, vaccine mandates. Remember the Prime Minister said to us constantly, he doesn't support vaccine mandates. You know why? Because he can't. Under the Federal Constitution, Section 5123A, they can't enforce civil conscription for medical procedures. So that's why he has not overruled the states. He agrees with it, but he's letting the states do what they want to do. So then my bit of um, legislation I brought in, and he said, well, I don't agree with it. And I said, then go away and bloody will change it so that you can agree with it and do something to actually make a difference to these people's lives. He didn't, because it doesn't suit his, his narrative. So they, they haven't done anything about it. That's when five members of parliament crossed, my, crossed the floor to support my bill. I then encouraged them for it to go to a Senate inquiry. The Lips Nationals supported me. It went down by one vote. One vote. So the Labor, Greens, Jackie Lambie, Rex Patrick and Sterling Brett voted against it. And that was to give the people, anyone, to put in a submission of how this COVID and how it's been handled has affected you. But it went down three times I tried and it went down. So what I'm saying is the Prime Minister is telling us one thing. If my bill had have got up, federal law would have overridden the state law and that would have been sorted out. But they didn't do it. So I want to know what the hell is going on. 
who's controlling the governance here. We seem to be in line with international interests and I think there's more to this than what we've been told and I think that we need to keep fighting. You, in your way, need to keep standing up, asking the questions. Don't be, don't be pushed and say, you're an anti-vaxxer, that's nothing to do with it. This is about our rights, our freedoms, and standing up and fighting for it. Because if we don't, and you don't have the true leadership, that you have the right people on the floor of parliament to continue fighting for, for this, I tell you what, I hate to see what the future of this nation is going to be like. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, it is interesting just how how um, how quick people are to actually desert the, the freedoms of the everyday person in Australia. Um, the reality is, if you see it in small business, you never see a small business person going out saying, I want to know these health details of my staff, I want to let these staff go, keep these staff. You'd never, ever see that. That's the sort of lunacy that comes from HR departments getting together with big government. Um, you see, big businesses have stepped in and done it, but small business would never do that. Um, small business knows the families of their workers um, and, and stands like that with them. Um, quite often, when the boss ain't getting paid, the workers are. That's the level of sacrifice that you see. You don't see bosses in small business going in and sacking workers, ever. I'd like to um, just invite James Lister if he's uh, able to pop up. No, no, he's uh, yep, unable to come. He's, he's stuck outside. Um, I'll give him a minute. He's missed his cue, there's a few that are outside. No, no good? Okay, yep. Um, all right, um, I'd like to uh, invite Phil up. Just to say a few words, Phil has been uh, an absolute champion for every every small business in the coffee industry, and um, he has uh, stood shoulder to shoulder with them. I know the reason he does it is he actually sees exactly what's going on. Um, nobody has a better understanding of all the, the coffee shops uh, that he supplies and works with and, and, and has mentored over the last few years than Phil Bellis. So I'd like to get him to come up and just say a couple of words. Thanks, Dad, and welcome. Obviously, congrats on what you guys are doing, which has our total support, and obviously, Senator Hanson and to Campbell, which I've known for a long time. Um, you know, it, it came along about 12 months ago where someone said where I was getting quite vocal and I was stepping up the vocality in a respectful way as much as you can. Um, it was, you know, bad things happen when good people do nothing, and I think that there's a lot of good people doing as much as they can, and a lot of them are scared, and especially in our industry, and give you a bit of insight. We, um, I sold to Bella Coffee, which started from nothing and became Australia's biggest, supplying 1,200 venues. I started a new business 12 months ago, right in the middle of this, um, called the Coffee Commune, which is here. And we now have 850 um, cafes that we supply product into through 37 different roasters and over 160 members. And the members part was the part that intrigued me the most, and that was to build an advocacy to build an advocacy portal where we're advocating for small business because most businesses that are in hospitality are small. They employ between four and say 15 people, um, but they've got the smallest voice. Um, and so not only do we help them with advocacy, we help with buying power and all the rest of it, but the advocacy's grown so big. And so when Dave came to me, he was talking about this idea, it was something we've jumped on and will be a big part of because it just adds validity to what we're doing. And keep it short, but key, key takeaways that has come out of me being vocal for the last 12 months on, on all my stuff and LinkedIn and all the rest of it that is getting massive views is why do you do it? Um, well, I don't do it for my personal gain because I'm fortunate enough to be in a, in a good financial position. I do it for the people because I think back to when I started in 2002 and I was lucky enough, Campbell was the Lord Mayor at that time, that we had a progressive local council uh, and we were able to work with them and we still do. I believe our council is doing great work now. But I look at um, um, state and I look at federal and it's dysfunctional. And the two points I want to make, one's already been made, you don't know what you don't know. So this bullshit about we're all in it together, well you can't be in it together when you haven't lost a day's pay and in fact you've increased your pay. That just tells me the arrogance and tone deaf of a politician, right? You are tone deaf and you are arrogant that not only do you take a, you don't take a pay cut, but you actually have the audacity to increase people's wages um, through this process. The next part is that, and this is the part that I want you guys to ponder and think about, is 
my position now stands at I don't agree or have a total dislike to governance of three to four years that affect a lifetime of decisions. So making decisions in three to four year terms that affect lifetimes is the biggest problem. And they're allowed to get away with it because there's no accountability and there's no integrity, and we're seeing it in the Queensland government right now, that any time integrity or accountability is questioned, it just gets thrown to the side and it should never be allowed. But that's something that I think that if we said what's the silver bullet or a silver bullet is that we've got to have accountability and integrity across all governments that they're not in a position of making decisions in a three and four year term that will impact people for a lifetime. Because I tell you, we're sitting here, a lot of small businesses going, this is impacting me. Well, if you think it's impacting you, I've got a 14 year old daughter and a 12 year old boy. I hate to see the impact it's gonna have on the next generation and the generation after because that starts now. The decisions and the work that we make now is gonna have the impact down the track. And I'll leave you with the last point, which is my favorite quote from Gandhi, be part of the change you wanna see in the world. So when people say, why? Why are you putting yourself out there? Why are you putting a target on your head? Why are you doing the rest of it? It's because I wanna be part of the change that I wanna see in the world. And the change I wanna see is I wanna see small business, family business have a voice. So I wanna see them be part and be at the decision table when government is making decisions. And it's not that hard. And I've personally been in Scott Morrison's year when he decided to give $750 away to everybody, um, even those that weren't working. Well, the person that wasn't working upgraded their scotch from Johnny Red to Johnny Black. Um, they didn't have a job to start with and they were living off what they were getting. There was no need to get paid more. Yet you had people like pilots and doctors and nurses and other people that couldn't work for whatever reason had to take a severe pay cut. We're not all of this together. And then I'll finish on this. I'm seeing a lot of politicians at all levels across all sides lately wear these equality t-shirts. Well, if we're so equal, how about we start making decisions that are equal for everybody? Thanks for coming and um, get behind the Small Business Union. Every little bit matters. I love the authenticity of somebody who's run a business. And um, Phil, how many business owners out there in the hospitality coffee sector, how hard are they doing it? Four, four, four of our clients closed their doors last week. Four clients closed the doors last week. Yeah, they, they, there'll be more to come. There'll be plenty more to come. Um, they're certainly not in this together. Now, those businesses that closed the doors, I'll tell you now, the owners of those businesses didn't take wages for months. And it wouldn't have been the first time they've tried to refinance their assets, the second and the third time they've got no more left to bleed out. Um, so anybody who's sitting there thinking, oh, you know, these rich business people, get alive. <laughs> get alive. It's not fair. Um, thank you to everyone who's coming today. I just want to hand over to my partner in crime in this, uh, Graham Haycroft, uh, who I started with uh, acknowledging, and um, hand over to um, Graham. And everybody take careful note of his shirt. <laughs> Workers first, bureaucracy last. Thank you, David. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Pauline and Campbell, for coming, and James Lister, who's stuck outside. Uh, it's interesting that the politicians that came along today I class as the top fighters in Australia. The big problem we've got is Everyone who goes into Parliament wants to be supplicant to the bureaucracy. So when I set up, and these guys are different, when I set up the, the Red Union, I, I saw retired in 2012, by the way, and I thought, gee, that'll be good, three months later, bored shitless. Uh, <laughs> surely it shouldn't be too hard. But interesting to see if we could set up a, a union structure that was about half the price. And although we've been fought, you know, tooth and nail, uh, we succeeded last last June, July. We had got something 7,000 7, members. We've now got 17,000 and Australia wide. And we've got a very, very effective legal and industrial relations backup, probably better than anywhere else in the country. Now, the other unions actually are bigger, the nurses' union are bigger, but they don't do anything. So they don't actually have a very big legal and industrial relations team. We've actually got it. Now, what I found with nurses in particular, just in Queensland Health, there's around about 100, 110,000 employees, 40,000 are nurses. We estimate that there's probably 20, 25,000 doctors, boardsmen, da da da, perception people. What are the other 45,000 do? I can tell you, they're bureaucrats. 
Every nurse who plays at health has their own dedicated bureaucrat. And it's the same in the education system. You've got 46,000 teachers, there's probably around about 30,000 bureaucrats. Small business. Years and years and years we've had industry associations, employer associations. Their sole role was to negotiate with the, with the bureaucrats to create new rules which effectively make competition more difficult. Because everyone in business is harder with the competition. It sounds attractive to start with, but it doesn't take very long before you realise that everybody bloody pays for it. We're now in the situation where how many bloody licences do you need to operate a business? Yeah. Really? I mean, can you talk about the directors? Directors thing. Do you know what that's about? It's to stop people setting up Phoenix companies. But ASIC knows who those people are. <laughs> they know their date of birth. They can check the, the change of name to register to see if the director's changed his or her name. They've got all the information. But no, we've got a whole new bureaucracy getting us, I started to do it, and I thought, oh, it's my language, but like this. You know, like, <laughs> I got other better things to do than fill out a bloody form. We've got about 10 companies. I have to go through the whole process for every bloody one of them, all to keep, what? Another thousand, two thousand bureaucrats in a job. This is what we've got to stop. This T-shirt tells the story. It's about workers first, bureaucracy last. The enemy of the health system is the bureaucracy. The enemy of the education system is the bureaucracy. The enemy of small business is the bureaucracy. And we've got to. What we've got to do is we've got to find politicians that will stand up and say, "I want to not. I want to work with the bureaucrats." We want someone to stand up and say, no, we're going to change the legislation and create their jobs. That's the only way you get rid of them. You want to get rid of the bureaucrats in the education system, you have to break up the school system so you have charter and independent schools. Where the schools will become self-contained, you don't need 30,000 bureaucrats. You might need about a, a couple of thousand. You've just freed up, you could pay every teacher in the state 25% more. Same with nurses. You break up the hospital system into individual hospital boards and, and you have a user, you know, user, uh, a user funded system, fund the user system, you could pay nurses another 25%. We're going to start thinking like this. And we get rid of the bureaucrats in the small business sector. How much more time would you have to do business? Anyway, so that's what we're about. We're going to be looking for politicians who want to stand with us and fight for small business and fight for workers. Get the bureaucrats out of our lives. And it's starting here, and thank you very much for coming. Coffee. I understand there's some coffees around here. Go that way and get some coffees. And uh, for those that are keen, there's union drinks at 4.30. Back here. See you then.